Good morning, good day, everyone. Whoops, my camera is, uh, yeah, okay. Good day, everyone. Uh, I hope my camera is open. Um, uh, good morning to our friends out west, Wendy and Amy, and I guess there's quite a few other participants that are there from out west in British Columbia, welcome. Um, thank you for being here today on a very special day. It is, as you all know, the International Women's Rights Day. And today we want to recognize uh, the important contribution of women in the life sciences industry. My name is Annie Perrault and I am the executive director of BioQuebec. BioQuebec represents more than 160 Quebec-based companies working in health research at all stages of the innovation process from basic research to the integration of therapeutic innovation into the healthcare system. They include biotech, CROs, investors, and biopharmaceutical companies at various uh, development stages. BioQuebec focuses on government relations, uh, business development, and partnership to foster the growth of Quebec's biotech and life sciences industry and position the province as one of the sector integral key players internationally. I'm very proud today. We are very proud at BioQuebec today with our friends of women in biotech. Um, to uh, present uh, a webinar that will focus on the importance of bringing more women into high executive position and on different life sciences companies board across Canada and the US and around the world. Our discussion will surely demonstrate that with more women on board, better decisions are taken. And if I may add today a personal note, considering the tragedy that our friends Ukrainians are going through, each time I see the images of delegations from Russia and Ukraine at the negotiation table, I can't help to think that maybe if some women were present at that table, discussion could be a bit different. After all, 50% of the Ukrainian and Russian populations are women. Shouldn't they be represented to discuss the ending of a horrible war that affect, affect them as much as men? Now let me introduce you to my colleague, Deborah, Chair of Women in Biotech of the Greater Montreal Chapter. Women in Bio is a not-for-profit organization supporting women in the life sciences sector. Deborah, is, Deborah Blake is a study director at the Charles River Labs, where she manages a portfolio of preclinical research studies in genetic toxicology. Prior to entering the CRO sectors, she gained extensive experience in the fields of function, functional genomics and system biology during her time as a post doctoral fellow at the University of Edinburgh and University de Montréal. Deborah received her BSc at McGill University, her master at the University of Ottawa and PhD from the Department of Molecular Genetics from the University of Toronto. Deborah, I turn it to you now and uh, uh, good webinar to everyone. Thank you so much, Annie, and welcome everyone. Women in Bio Greater Montreal is very pleased to be working with a valued partner like BioQuebec who shares our commitment in promoting the lead careers, leadership, and entrepreneurship of women in the life sciences. For those of you who may not know, Women in Bio is a volunteer organization operating throughout North America, which in 2022 will be celebrating 20 years of supporting diversity and inclusion for women in the life science sector. And it's done so by recognizing that the most effective way to make a difference and drive real change is by supporting women at all stages of their career, starting with young girls in high school, to women first joining the workforce, to entrepreneurs, senior executives, and all the way to the boardroom. While we're very proud of our members and their successes, we also recognize there's a lot of work to be done. When we take a closer look at Canadian corporate boards, we see that diversity or lack of diversity is still a major issue. Despite some companies implementing targets to increase the number of women on their boards, by mid-2021, women held only 23% of all board seats among TSX listed companies that actually disclosed the composition of their boards. And that's only an increase of 2% from 2020. If we then take a closer look at women board representation by industry, you will be surprised to hear that Canadian utilities and pipeline sector 
has the highest number of women on their boards at 35%, whereas the life science sector has the second lowest with only 17. That is why Women in Bio Greater Montreal in partnership with Bio-Quebec is delighted that today we are co-hosting a panel discussion about how to change this equation and drive greater gender parity on life science corporate boards. Leading this discussion will be our moderator, Tasha Kiridan, one of Canada's top 100 powerful women for her work in media and communications by the Women's Executive Network. Tasha Kiridan is a principal at Navigator Limited, Canada's leading high stakes strategic advisory and communication firms. She was born and raised in Montreal and now lives in the greater Toronto area. Tasha is a lawyer, strategist, thought leader, businesswoman, broadcaster, political columnist, and proud mom, and was until yesterday exploring a bid to the leadership of the Conservative Party of Canada and will be working to seek the office in the next federal election. Join me in welcoming Tasha Kiridan. Thanks. Thanks so much, Deborah, for that kind introduction. And uh, it's an enormous pleasure to be here on this day. Um, I am uh, really uh, very honored to be here because all of you have blazed so many trails in an industry, as you said, which is uh, not diverse enough, not inclusive enough of women. And um, so I, I tip my hat to you. Um, I am really looking forward to this conversation. I'd like to introduce our panelists now. Uh, we're going to be talking about boards, and many of them have been or are on boards and have experience or experience in the boardroom as CEOs or executives of their respective companies. Let me introduce first to you Kirsten Coombs. She is the president of AstraZeneca, and uh, she is a proven senior business leader and a business executive with 25 years of experience in both the North American and global biopharmaceutical industry. She has a great passion for science, improving patient care, and she's come to AstraZeneca Canada after playing a critical role in building and leading the company's cardiovascular and metabolic disease franchise in the US where she served as vice president. During her 17 years with the company, she has served in various roles across many areas of the business in supply chain and commercial operations and held also marketing and sales leadership roles. And so she knows the business inside and out and climbing that ladder. So thank you so much for being here, Kirsten. Annie Perrault is a dear friend of mine, and uh, we go way back. And her career also goes way back. She is the general manager now of BioQuebec and chair of the Genome Quebec Board of Directors. She graduated from the University of Ottawa with a law degree in 1992, practiced law in Montreal at Phillips and Weinberg. And um, then from 2001 and 2006, she became vice president at Genome Canada. Her career has focused on public relations in regards to genome research and biotechnology. And she is also a judge of the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal until December 2021, and now continues to act as a mediator for that tribunal. She became a certified corporate director in 2013. And she's the chair of the board at Genome Canada and a member of boards of the directors and the Fondation Jeanne Moss. I want to now introduce Amy Finney. She is a senior director with Admari Bio Innovations, where she does program development and partnership work. And she is uh, using her biomedical research and business background there to guide serious scientific collaborations. Most recently, she was at Northwestern University in Chicago, where she led an academic VC partnership to translate American, um, academic discoveries into novel therapies. Prior to Northwestern, she gained extensive experience in managing academic pharma collaborations and biotech pharma alliances at Abbott and AbbVie Labs in Chicago, and transitioned into pharma following postdocs here where I'm sitting in the University of Toronto and Free University of Amsterdam. Wendy Hurlbert is the president and CEO of Life Sciences BC. She is a passionate global executive with more than 25 years of experiences in the life sciences and, technolo and technology sectors, and is the president and CEO now of Life Sciences BC. Um, she's held leadership positions in many companies, including Johnson & Johnson, also the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Ontario and Lexmark International. She has a BA in finance and economics um, and also a certificate in strategic leadership from the Sauter School of Executive Education. And she serves on several boards, including Clinical Trials BC Advisory Board, the External Advisory Committee for the Center of Health Evaluation and Outcome Science. And she previously served on the board for the Center for Research and Drug Discovery. 
So a lot of experience at this table, uh, honored to be here. Um, let's open the floor for a conversation about boards and why they matter. It might seem trite to say, why should there be more women on boards? But, you know, Kirsten, I'll start with you. Why is it important to have more women on boards today? Well, first off, thank you so much for creating this opportunity. As I was sitting here listening to you read all the bios, one of the coolest things about this type of panel is that you get to meet so many accomplished leaders that just happen to be female. And, you know, as being someone who has just moved to Canada, I just quite inspired and have and feel very lucky to actually be able to meet so many cool ladies. So just glad to be here today. I think it's really important and it kind of goes into my answer a bit. I think that not only is it important from a business outcome perspective, whatever the board may be, that you have a diverse point of view and gender parity on those boards, but I also think that it's really important the, the network that is created, um, not only kind of within, within the business setting, but in the broader community. Because I think one of the, the places that we have a true opportunity as senior female leaders uh, in the industry is really, as Deborah talked about, helping bring up the next generation of leaders that are to come. And we can only do that if we collectively have a strong network that brings together and really identifies that talent across our different organizations and different industries and help them progress their careers. Wendy, uh, and the boards you sat on and the boards you sit on, um, what do you see as the contribution that women make that really needs to be at that table? Um, well, I think, um, that uh, I've sat on boards and management teams where I've been the only female for for you know a decade in one company. Um, so you know I think that it's very far reaching, but a little bit of building off what Kirsten was saying, I think the importance of diversity on boards is for diversity of thought. And I think sometimes we get caught up with we should have more women on boards or more diversity on boards because unfortunately it sometimes comes across as just the right thing to do. But it actually, and you know, there's lots of studies of how much more effective boards are when they have diversity. But you know, as a passionate female leader that feels like I've had to fight my way sometimes, sometimes more collaboratively, sometimes not, at the end of the day, it's about diversity of thought. And um, that I think is really, really the why, do, why is this important? Hmm. Amy, do you think that companies understand that? Is there enough understanding of the, of the reasons why that's not just a numbers game, but it actually improves the bottom line and the way companies approach problems? Did you ask Annie or Amy? Amy. Oh, I have to be really clear. <laughs> this is going to be tough. <laughs> I said Amy, but Annie, you can answer the question. You can build on her answer afterwards if you like. Go ahead, Amy. <laughs> Could you repeat the question? I'm, my, I'm my deep question in thought was, about what Wendy, what Wendy was saying. <laughs> sure. Well, I was actually touching on what Wendy said. Do you think companies realize the importance of the diversity of thought piece? That it's it's not just a numbers game or to say, look, we have diversity for diversity's sake, but that there is this real contribution to the bottom line and to a company's approach problems that women can bring. Um, do you think that that's appreciated enough? I think it's starting to be. Uh, I think uh, just like Wendy, I've sat on many senior management teams and, and, and presentations to, to senior managers and board boards that I'm the only woman in the room. And, you know, I, I think there is now, particularly because of the studies that Wendy was referencing, <laughs> There is now a recognition that it's not just a numbers game, right? This is about that diversity of thought. We, we need different perspectives. And I think that goes beyond women in the boardroom. I think that goes into all of the diversity uh, and inclusion activities that we're seeing really get to the surface now and get to a level where people want to action them. I think <clears throat> the challenges that we face is that, the, you know, we first have to recognize that that's the important. It's not just a numbers game. And I think that that's coming. Um, but I think we also have to to then face the challenge of bringing this forward. And I think all of us, you know, have to recognize that we all have an inherent bias to 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 bring in people that are similar to ourselves. And, and I think the numbers game that maybe we have to play at first is in order to get that part level so that once we, we get a little bit of div more diversity in the boardrooms and on senior management teams, that 
it becomes a much more natural thing. And then we have diversity of thought um, and, and we have people, you know, the, the inherent biases that we have as humans, right? To bring more people in that are like us that will preserve what we're trying to do. So I do think that it's recognized that it's more than a numbers game, but I think that there is good reasons at this moment to play a little bit of a numbers game in order to get us to the level where it will be sustainable. All right, That's well, I need... Yeah, let me yeah. ask you about that. Is it about target setting? I mean, what? how do we get to those numbers? I knew you were going to get there <laughs> with me. I would love me because you know my opinion about I that. I do. Um, yeah, I do take a, a, yeah, it is, of course, I'm agreeing with Wendy that it is all about diversity of opinions and making sure that we bring uh, more um, women on the board because they represent, after all, 50% of the population. But at the end of the day, it is a numbers game because the numbers are not yet at 50%. In 2019, women represented 27% of board members, according to the enterprises that were listed on the stock market. Uh, and it was only 18% in 2015. Uh, so we're still far from that 50%. And um, if I take in Quebec, for instance, um, there was a law actually that was passed in 2006 by the government at the time. Um, and that law made it mandatory for Societe d'État, for state companies, such as, uh, you know, the, the liquors and uh, at Lotto Quebec, or which would be BC Lottery in, in BC, you know, the state company, to have by 2011 at least between 40 and 60% of women on their board. And that piece of legislation actually worked. In 2011, we had reached 42% of women on boards of, of Hydro-Quebec, Loto-Quebec, uh, and all other crown company. I don't know how you call it in English exactly, but I think you okay. understand what I'm saying. So it did, we're talking to 20, we're talking 2006, that's not, that far away, but it took that piece of legislation to make people realize they, that they needed to make an effort to make sure that they would bring women part of the board. And um, the reason it may be because it is, it is different to approach women to come on board than it is for men. Even myself, when I was called to, uh, to be on the, and offered a position on my first big board, uh, remunerated board, my first reaction was, are you sure I can do this? Um, do I really have the, 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 the background for that, the knowledge? I mean, while th that the person on the other end of the line was like laughing, like a oh, typical answer from a woman, if I'm calling you, it's because I think you should be on that board, you know? And, and then I said, okay, I'm going to learn and I'm going to, I'm going to bring what I can bring, but not, it's, it's more difficult to go and get the women. So sometimes it takes that little, that little piece, you know, uh, of effort that we need to make. And I think in Quebec in particular, and I don't know if the same kind of legislation exists in the provinces, but what it did is that it affected the private companies because they saw that the, the government and the, the state companies needed to act there. They started acting as well. Now we haven't reached that 42% level, but you know what? In Norway, in Scandinavian countries, in Germany, in France, they have put a similar piece of legislation for private companies as well. And they went from less than 20% to 42, 47% in Germany, in the Scandinavian countries, in less than five years. So I'm just saying, if we really want to achieve that 50%, maybe we need that little, you know, help. <laughs> Uh, and, 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 and I think it's going to happen. Otherwise, if we don't do that, I don't know what's going to be the number in 2022, but I'm, it's 27% right now. And it's not 50. And it's not representing the population as it should be. So that's my opinion. I think we should force it a little bit. But uh, yeah. Okay, I'm going to play devil's advocate for a second. Of course. That's also are. why I'm here. Um, because you're a lawyer that, and you like yeah, that. that too. Exactly. <laughs> Guilty. Yes. Uh, I, I'm a, I'm a, how should I say, reformed lawyer, actually. Um, but uh, I will say that some will say that in response to uh, what Annie has just outlined, that this is a quota system and 
women don't want to be treated as a quota. You want to advance on merit and you want to be appointed to a board because of your expertise and not have in the back of your mind, perhaps, well, yeah. is it just because of my gender? So I'm going to put it, um, let me put it to you, Wendy. Asha, uh, I wonder how many men ask themselves that question when they were appointed before. Were, am I there just because I'm a man and a friend of someone? No, because you're supposedly have the quality. And if you're going there on the board, it's because you have, or if they don't think so, prove them wrong. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> All right. I know, I know what you're saying. I want to see if there's anyone who has a different point of view or not. And I want to ask you, Wendy, since you, you like I said, you, you have extensive board experience, um, your sense of, of the need for that. Do we need targets? Is that counterproductive or is that a necessary step? I think, um, there's a, there's a lot of debate about this question about targets, which is one of the reasons why not every province has adopted it and not every stock exchange has adopted it. But um, I do think it's, you know, if you think of a, a toolkit that you have to try and achieve the outcome of a greater um, gender, gender parity, but also diversity on a board, it certainly is one of the tools there. And I know of companies that even when exchanges haven't put this in place, have required as they go through their board recruitment to at least look at, you know, however many female candidates and male candidates. So there are ways you can do it without legislation. Um, I think it's a culture. I, I really do think um, it does come down to when you're when you're populating a board, what are you looking for? And um, you know, best practices and governance are going to say you want a skills-based board and you want a board that represents both your customer base, but I would also argue your employee base in some ways. Mm -hmm. And at least as it relates to a management team. Um, and so it's a it's a matrix that you that you pull together. Um, you also, as you look at skills, like I just go back again to diversity of thought. Um, you know, in the life sciences sector, one of the other things is look for people that have skills from outside of the life sciences sector. You know, that work in highly regulated environments and you know compliance and quality systems, etc. So, you know, quotas I think are a part of the toolkit. Um, but a cultural change of really valuing that diversity of thought and really valuing diversity that that your board is going to reflect, you know, the population, your customers, you know, whatever works, you know, your customer set, your employee base, and where you're trying to go is super important. And we do have a long way to go, which is why generally I'm not that big a fan on quotas, but I do think it is a toolkit that uh, one of those tools in our toolkit that unfortunately does have to be used. Well, and it doesn't raise, have to be permanent, obviously. Yeah. No, you raise a good point about reflecting your employees um, in, your, uh, in your boards and in your senior management too, because we know now studies show employee satisfaction is a big issue for retention for companies across, across the board, not just in the life sciences. But we have a question that relates to that here from Carlo Mastrangelo, and I'm gonna actually put it to you, Kirsten. Um, because it relates to that representation issue. And he asks, why do you believe there's such a gap of women in senior leadership between health sciences and other industries? What's holding the sector back? And I'm wondering if that relates a bit to the pool of people to pull from, because there are fewer women in general in the life sciences represented at the employee level as well. So how do we fix that situation? Yeah, and so maybe just to back up and give you my perspective on quotas and numbers, uh, just sure. because I, I don't want to miss being in the frying pan with everybody else. <laughs> Fry <laughs> away. <laughs> you know, it's, it's interesting because if you look at the evolution, I don't think you will meet any senior leader, no matter their gender or their, their background, that says that diversity on any team is important. I think conceptually everybody agrees to that. And I think I think that the best organizations, whether they're public or private, have moved in that direction. Where I see the challenge, specifically working for a large a scientific organization, is in the execution. So while I have a lot of male senior leaders who report to me, what will ultimately come up is to, I got no females, no females applied for the role, or they weren't qualified, or it was too hard for me to find a diverse panel. We have, we have pretty kind of strict guidance at AstraZeneca that suggests, right, all panels, when we interview, should have a diverse slate 
which means that we shouldn't go to an interview process until we have diversity amongst our candidates and the people interviewing should also represent some type of diversity. And that should allow you to take out some of the inherent bias that occurs in the interview process to try to get the best candidate in place. But even with those rules, we still at the most senior levels within our organization struggle to have gender parity reflective of the populations in which we work in. And I think for that point, if you don't necessarily hold folks accountable to a number, it is too easy to say, I tried, but I failed. So therefore I went with the next best candidate. I think to Ani's point that if you, if you say, no, we are not going to compromise on having gender or ethnic diversity or age diversity, whatever the metric may be, it actually makes leaders work a bit harder to find the right candidates. Because I think that that goes to your question. Even in the STEM area, while it is very clear, well documented that from the time of high school all the way through to, to, the, to the workforce, females are underrepresented. That doesn't mean there aren't great candidates out there to fill the next level role. It just means we have to work a little bit harder to find them. And we have to invest more to be able to mentor them so that they are ready for the next level of leadership, whether it be in a management type of role, whether it be in a board type of role, or whether it be in, in you know, a lab environment or an R&D environment. And I think that that's where organizations specifically in the STEM area need to continue to focus and invest in making sure that not just gender parity is coming up through the ranks, but I would also suggest underrepresented minorities. You make a very good point about mentorship, and I, I'd like to ask about that because that is something that is critical, I think, to encouraging uh, young women and girls to see themselves in the role and not just see themselves, but, but have an actual role model that they can relate to. Um, Amy, I see you nodding and I'm wondering if you could maybe expand on the importance of mentorship, maybe from a personal perspective, you've been mentored or mentored others or any programs that your company may have, uh, have executed in that regard. Absolutely. Um, uh, you did see me nodding my head. Um, I think that this is an absolute key to to success, uh, I think I was thinking a lot about what Annie was saying with regards to that question that that every woman and I, I agree with your your point, Annie. That I'm not sure men ask the same question when you're asked when you're when you're invited to a board or when you're when you're offered a job. You know that there is that challenge to think through. Am you know am I being hired just to hit the numbers, right? And a mentor. Somebody who has actually gone through the process, somebody who can help you talk through that challenge, I think it is an absolute key to, to getting over that, that question and recognizing where to appropriately put those thoughts and how to appropriately manage those in order to go forward. And so I, I am, I, you know, I've had, um, I've had certainly some very impactful female mentors over the years who have coached me through those things. Um, and, and I think that there's also, that, so that, that's one part of the mentor part that I, I value. But there's also, uh, of course, the, the personal aspect of feeling different in a, in a group. And, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, I've been on management teams where I am the only female sitting in the room and you feel different. And, and in order to really navigate that successfully, I think having a mentor to, to help you address those things, to help you cope with those things, to help you figure out how to put that in a perspective. Somebody who has navigated it successfully has been impactful for me. Uh, and I, I think it's something that no, that every, every person, not just every woman sh should have is uh, somebody who can really help them address those challenges. Any, um, have you experienced mentorship or does Bio-Quebec actively mentor? I mean, you have events like this and, uh, you know, I know Life Sciences BC does, does the same. The whole organization is essentially a, a mentorship factory in a way to encourage women to see themselves in these senior roles. Um, but are there any specifics that could be done to really um, in, encourage companies to implement policies that would structure mentorship into the way they do business? Well, I totally agree with Amy that mentorship is really, really important. We do not have specifically a program at Bio-Québec, but there is a program that, uh, of uh, mentorship done by Montréal in Vivo, which is our um, Grappe Industrielle. I don't know how to say that in English, but it's a, some kind of a, a group that federates all the life sciences uh, actors. Umbrella um, group. 
yeah, umbrella group. Yes, you're right. Uh, and they do have a mentorship program, not specifically designated for women, but it is a mentorship program. Um, I'd like to add, and I think the end of the, at the end of this webinar, we'll be, um, the Women in Bio will be announcing something which is going to speak to something that is really important for women, which is giving them the tools um, to feel that they can actually take those positions on different boards. And uh, as I mentioned before, I think it is something, uh, and I'm not saying it's specific to women. I, I, I'm sure there are men that also want to have the best knowledge and, and feel that they have the tools to, to do their job. But particularly for women, it is something that we need to have. We feel that you know, if we're asked to be on the board, we need to know more about governance and audit and, 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 and how does it work on the board. So it, those tools, the, that kind of knowledge, me particularly, I, I went to the University of Laval and I did get that certificate for governance because I felt this was gonna help me to be a better directors on, on the board. And then after that, the experience. So I think giving women, yes, mentorship, somebody, and that person actually doesn't have to be a woman. Uh, in my case, it, it, my mentors have been most of the time, all the time, pretty much men, because I do think that to change the culture, we need, and we have a lot of men that support this. And it, and, and it takes, I mean, I remember when I was asked to be vice president of Genome Canada, I was only 30 years old. And I was, uh, the president called me and, and it was a man, obviously, and he was a scientist, PhD, the whole thing. And I'm like, he said, no, I, I trust you. I think you can do the job. I wouldn't call you otherwise, you know, and, and, and he mentored me after that. And I think the confidence that you get from people that are saying, yes, you can do it uh, is really, really important, but it doesn't have to be a, specifically a, a woman. I, I think actually men can do a lot in supporting women around them and giving them the confidence that they need. So, Yeah. No, that's really interesting because actually we have a question in the chat uh, exactly on that point from Sarah Rahala. She said, would love to get the thoughts of the panel on the role men can play as allies. I so didn't see that. Being, that's funny. Yeah, I didn't see that. you read her mind, Annie. But I'm gonna, <laughs> I read her mind, yes. I'm going to throw it to Wendy to, to expand on that too. And again, feel free to talk about personal experience and what, what has made a difference in your career. Um, you know, the role of men in this equation, because, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's 50, 50, or well, I guess 51, 49, really, but, um, you know, uh, men are equal partners in, in our ventures or should be. So how can they be allies in this fight? Um, well, I think it's, I think it's super important that, that men are involved and the leaders are involved. Um, you know, I, I think that, um, I'm sure we've all been in a number of conversations about women on leadership teams, women on boards, and we're missing a big piece of the equation when we don't have a man as part of that conversation, especially mm -hmm. when you go back to what those stats were that were talked about at the beginning, and Annie has, has referenced them. Um, you know, so it's super important that we have champions and in this case, given the divide, the gender divide that exists, those champions, all roads lead to them being men, you know, at the at the equation and really fundamentally believing that it's important because it, it is important. I wanted to come back to this mentoring conversation, though, because it's it comes up all the time about women's inherent um, I think the book that was written by the CFO of Facebook the, and used the term imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. And I can say early in my career, I had um, a situation that I, I joined an organization as a controller. I had a finance and economics background. I hadn't, I'd been working in sales and marketing. I happened to be friends with the person that was leaving the job who recommended me for it. And I was interviewed by a male who was the president of the company and a male who was the vice president of the company. And a little bit similar to Annie, I was like, I'm really flattered that you're talking to me, but I really don't know that I can do this job. Like I don't have the five years of experience. And the VP of sales said to me, well, of course you can, it can't be that complicated. And part of that was because he didn't actually know what the job was, but it was the controller of the organization 
And my friend who was leaving was like, of course you can do this job. So anyway, they ended up hiring me more because my friend said, you should hire this person. Um, and it just was the path of least resistance for them. But I lived for five years in that imposter syndrome. And I don't know that a male would have lived in that space. And so I was lucky I could call my friend up. I was calling her up six months later, like, what account did you book this charge to? And she would remember the account number. Like, you know, so I had, I had my, you know, my little call a friend um, thing going on. But I do think it is inherently how, for whatever reason, women leaders don't have the confidence to say, yes, I can do this. And so we always revert back to programming and say, oh, I'll go get another designation. I'll go get another degree. I'll go get whatever. And it's not to say they're not important because they are important. And being on a board is different than being on a management team. You have to understand what your role is versus what the management team's role are. So these programs are really important. But I do think it's interesting that we, we, we also need to just be able to say, well, yeah, look at my background. I can stand up and be considered for this role because I am qualified. But we tend to not put ourselves out. And so mentoring is super important, but also us taking the risk to say, yes, I, I can do this. That, okay. that is also a question of, of culture that we need to change. But I think it, I see it changing a little bit. Um, I don't want to bring age into this, but I will. <laughs> I, 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 I seem, I'm meeting women 25, 30, and they don't seem to have that problem of, <laughs> I, I, I have the guts and I can do it. And, and maybe it is a generational issue, or maybe we are raising our daughters differently and it's making a difference because I think it has an impact. I have two daughters and the, the, I, I like to think that the image I'm projecting to them and what I'm doing, the fact that I'm taking risk and I'm taking uh, positions that are not always easy, you know, uh, that it's showing them that they can do that as well. So maybe it is starting to change, but it's going to, it's a long process and it's a culture uh, issue. But I heard this morning um, a woman talking about because of it's women's day there's a lot of women interviewed today and she was talking about the fact that her problem is not the gender issue it's the age issue she's always the youngest everywhere she shows up <laughs> and uh and there's a, a tendency from men and women to say oh well you're you're so young you don't you, mm -hmm. you don't have the experience yet you, you haven't you know you're 10 years of difference with and and she says, that's what she has to fight. And so it's now it's a different kind of, you know, I, I could see the change in her voice that she doesn't care. She's young, but she's taking the risk. And so it was, it was interesting to hear. And I think it's a question of, um, of bringing more women that will make the difference, will show that we're capable of, and that's going to bring more women in and it's going to make a difference, but maybe I'm just idealistic. I don't know. No, you know what? I think, I think confidence is incredibly important. And I think young women um, have been encouraged to have confidence, maybe in a way that our generation aging myself here or dating myself mm -hmm. <laughs> might've been less encouraged. Um, and I wanted to throw that to you, Kirsten, too, is in terms of engendering that confidence. Um, how do we get women to feel that they can step into that role without the imposter syndrome. Um, if it's not, you know, getting uh, certificates and this kind of thing, it, maybe it, it's something psychological or something personal. How do we instill that confidence and how, how did you find it in your career? Yeah, you know, as I was listening to Ani speak, I was trying to think about the first time I felt potentially disadvantaged as a female in, in the workplace. So, you know, I've had a very long career and basically have grown up at AstraZeneca. And I honestly think that it probably wasn't until I really hit kind of the senior leadership level that I felt any type of gender bias. Up until that point, I felt like I could compete against anyone on my own merit and get any role I wanted to and progress my career nicely, which is quite interesting when you think about it. I think that folks that are joining the workforce today, and actually I look at my own organization, when we look at kind of the more junior entry level, earlier in career individuals, 
the gender um, parity is almost identical to, to the general population. We're at about 50-50. Maybe we actually even index a little bit higher on the female level. So we're actually bringing in a good diversity of, of individuals. The challenge becomes as we move up in the organization, as the more senior decision makers who are longer in their careers, where I think the gender bias comes in. And I think that this, is, this goes to what, what, we, what Amy was speaking about earlier. I think that's where female mentorship actually helps even more so than male mentorship. The female saying, I'm feeling this, because you have that moment where you're like, is this, am I actually feeling discriminated against? Like that first moment, you're like, it can't possibly be. This is what I read in the books and it's actually happening to me. Or did he just ask me to go get his coffee? Like I am the boss here, right? Like, oh my God, happened. And, and you almost are like, I can't believe it. And that's where I think where you have a really strong set of female uh, counterparts who can help navigate that because we've all felt it in some way, shape or form. But the other piece around male sponsorship, there is research that shows, especially in the corporate world, that one of the keys to female success up to senior levels is male sponsorship and specifically white male sponsorship. And so you can't underestimate kind of the, the, the institution that you're operating in and how important it is to when you're not at the table or when your, your female mentors aren't sitting there to have that male sponsorship, that I think also can help because it doesn't, I don't know that we will overcome the imposter syndrome that is so ingrained in many of us from very early on in our, in our childhoods all the way up through our careers. But I think there are ways you can kind of neutralize it between mentorship and sponsorship. And then, you know, what I often see with female leaders is just really solid hard work. Most of the female leaders I work with, they are, they've grown their careers through complete dedication and really kind of just working harder than their counterparts that has actually allowed them to excel. And I think some of that's just innate into who we are as, as leaders and really as females. Um. I want to throw it to you, Amy, uh, there's a question that actually leads to sort of expectations of how women act um, in roles. And it's from Nushat Nipa. She asks, I was informed by one of my mentors, believe it or not, to be, to be thrived or to thrive in industry sector outside of academia, I need to be more aggressive. But she would like to know what that means. What is the meaning of aggressive? And I think that's interesting because often aggression in women is perceived very different from men. It's taken as more negative as opposed to men, it's assertive. So how, how do you feel? What, what would be successful aggression in this context to you? This is a really interesting question at this time. And I was just making some notes uh, about Kirsten's comment about male sponsorship and the value of that. And I think this actually plays very nicely into to that. First of all, I don't think being aggressive does anybody any good at any time. So uh, whoever's mentor told you to be aggressive, I would park that. Um, <laughs> I think what they're really trying to tell you is that the male and female communication styles are very often different. That's something we just have to face, right? It is different. Um, and I think the challenge that as a woman that you have is you have to face the, this happened to me very recently, right? You're in a situation and the, the situation is I said something in a particular way. I presented it in a particular way. And the people in the room didn't seem to hear me well. A male counterpart repeated what I said. And all of a sudden, everybody was like, oh, that's a great idea. And I was like, how did that happen? So I think not thinking about things as an, an aggressive approach, but think about your communication style, right? And males communicate differently. And then I, I really spent hours after that meeting thinking, could I have said that in a more male way oh. to be heard better? And, and, and that's, I think, a question. And I, I actually don't want to be to speak in a more male way. I would like to be able to navigate a way where us as females can communicate more effectively to a broad, diverse people. And I think that there's, it's communication style that I think we need to focus on not being aggressive. Does that make sense? I think it does. And any you've been a communications expert for many years. How would you advise women to communicate uh, effectively to get ahead and to get onto boards? 
Wow. And you're frozen and we're not communicating at all. Oh no. All right, I'll flip the question. Could I, could I, could I just, just, just Kirsten, jump in, sure. Yeah, because, you know, Amy, it's such an interesting point, and, and could we be more effective in our communication? Maybe. But really what you need at that table is an ally, whether it be a female, male. Like, you need someone to say, I believe that's what Amy just said. Can we just go back? Like, you need somebody else at the, and this is why it's, a, you can't just have one or two females. You need, you need at least a quarter of a team, whether it be a board team or a management team, that is gender diverse, because then it's not that the female spoken up and you've got enough people at the table who can actually say, wait a second, can we just back up as a team? Because I, I think that's what I just heard. And, and that's, that's where the power, where you actually start to see the shift in, in teams really being effective. If you've, if you've got an ally at the table, male or female to say, wait a second, I just heard that already. Absolutely. Am I still frozen? Uh, You're faster? not. No, I okay, love I love to have your take on on communication because it is you know communication styles are different and there's people will say objective things like a lower voice that is more authoritative and you know does that does that hold true or is it as uh, as Kirsten said so because you have a lot of people at the table who believe that and so they'll pay more attention to it. My concern about that is that. Are, are we asking ourselves to change and adapt to what men are? I mean, I'd like to think that we can be ourselves, uh, but I think instead of using the more the, the word aggressive, I would say more risk-taking um, might be a better way to say it without kind of um, qualifying women as being not aggressive and men aggressive. <laughs> I think we tend to think and overthink maybe sometimes situation and uh, it analyze and it shows in the way we talk too because we'll make a big circle before we get to where we want to get and so more direct uh, more risk taking I think is a better way of, of looking at it um, I find that often there's a lot of we should speak less and act a little bit more <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's the that's the way we should be when we talk too. Uh, and 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 I don't know if it's a man way, but I like to think it's just more uh, of a um, efficient way <laughs> of getting at things. But uh, you know, there's all different ways of looking. I mean, we're all different people. I think we need to accept that 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 we have people that think we don't speak the right way maybe should be a little bit more open to different ways that people can talk about issues. So there's, we all have bias and I think that's what we, we need to work on. It's the different, un, the bias that we have inside of us and we don't even know about it. It's, oh, she, she, she's talking like this, she must be uh, not able to make decision or he's talking like this, it's clearly aggressive or, but basically we need to stay open um, and we all need to work very hard on that because look at us we're all um, women white women uh, right now on the panel and I'm thinking um, there's also you know it's not easy either for uh, women from different culture or background um, uh, men of different culture and background um, people who, that might have an handicap. I mean, there's, there's, we have a lot of bias for not just gender issue, but for many issues. So just working on that, um, maybe training uh, in, in, uh, on bias would be helpful. You remember maybe um, there was a woman in Quebec that was not treated at the emergency uh, and she died. She was an autochton. She was... Um, how do you say that in English? She was, she was Inuk, actually. Yeah. yeah, Inuk. Yeah, yeah. She was uh, from the my region, north of Joliet, where I'm from, and Joyce Eshekwan, thats her name. And after that, they did some um, training session with nurses and and doctors, and um, and and in in they realized that even those who think that they don't have bias, we have bias. <laughs> and for treatment of people, it means sometimes that. You, 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 they'll think that she has that kind of situation. She she might have, she probably drank 
because she, you know, she, she's an indigenous person. We have that biases, so we don't treat her the same way. Just because in our head, we didn't say it out loud. It's just that we start from a different perspective and it's a biased perspective. And, and so we need to, this is just to give you an example that we all have those bias inside of us and we don't know about them. So it's gender, but it's also diversity. So one way that we need to, what, one thing that we need to work on and that's going to be helpful for everybody, including us women, is working on biases that we might have. And that includes the communication, obviously. I want to also ask about a very practical aspect um, in the time we've got left to about how you get into the space where someone considers you for a board, the networking piece. Because as we know, um, men and women may communicate differently in certain respects. We also network differently in certain respects. So, um, you know, not every woman, I'm going to stereotype here, loves golf. I know I'm horrible at it. Um, and uh, the stereotype is, well, let's just go golfing. You'll get on the board. I'm just using that <laughs> one example. But my point is, how do women effectively network? Because we're great. We're social. We, we, we communicate and talk in our private lives very easily. But how do we make the right networking choices? And I'm going to ask you, Wendy, if you might have some thoughts on that. Um, effective networking for women to get onto boards. Um, yeah, thank you for that. I, I actually also just want to go back to this aggressive comment, which I'll take the um, leap of saying it is connected to networking. So because if you are <laughs> being told to go out and be aggressive, um, that's just a word that has negative connotation. So I agree, like, you know, maybe, maybe she's trying to say more direct or more confident. So like there's other words that may achieve the same outcome. But something that a very wise person said to me many years ago, which I repeat all the time, is speak into the listening ears of the person that you're trying to influence. And that is as it relates to sales. Um, as a CFO, uh, a little known fact is when you're a CFO, you spend your life in sales because you're negotiating budgets, you're negotiating, you know, and you're trying your best to get the best budget in a global environment um, for your company. So Kirsten, I hope your Canadian CFO is your best friend because they're working really hard for you. So the speak into your listening ears is really, um, it goes back to what Amy was saying. You know, so um, yes, maybe we need to change our communication a bit, but I, I take this broader than gender. It's who are you trying to influence and what do you know about them on how they listen? And what do you know about them about what their interests are? Um, and so it's very hard if you're walking into a room to Kirsten's point and you don't know anybody and you know nothing about them. And then you do this fantastic presentation and it may have completely gone over their head because they don't, they don't understand the way you're communicating with them. Um, so an ally in the room is one way. Another way is, uh, which happens in big companies all the time, a, a little pet peeve of mine, the pre-meetings of the meetings mm. so that you can find out what people are up to. In a networking environment, a lot of people really like to talk about themselves. And so the best, I mean, I personally, I now work in a job that I'm networking all the time. I hated going to networking events. Absolutely hated them. I needed to find like a friend in a sea of men usually. <laughs> and, um, but I think, you know, start small, find someone to talk to, learn a little bit about them, and then you'll start making those connections. But it really is to me about trying to find something that gives you an insight that then you're able to speak into their listening ears because that's ultimately what you want. And, and as I say, I mean, it's about gender, but it's also about anything you're trying to influence, whether it's a female or whomever. Kirsten, what networking has worked for you um, in terms of advancing your career, whether it's in the boardroom or, or through the ladders on in the corporate ladder? Well, you know, as I was listening to Wendy talk, I, I was thinking for me personally and to so many of those um, females who are coming up through, through corporations, just understanding how important it is to be on a board. If nothing else comes out of today, that would be my big takeaway. Because honestly, you know, it, it probably wasn't until a year or so ago that any of my mentors or any of the career conversations I was having around what were my next steps involved being on an outside board. It was all about what do I do within AstraZeneca and what roles do I need to demonstrate? And so one of my big 
big learnings coming here to Canada and really engaging in the Canadian marketplace is the importance of the network and the importance of the board and the importance of representing AstraZeneca outside of the four walls of our business. And so that nobody, nobody taught me that. Nobody within AstraZeneca said, hey, Kirsten, really your next step is to do X, Y, and Z, and we should try to help you find some board seats. So I would just encourage the, the folks listening today to understand how important it is as part of your, your overall career development. And, and sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, Amy, um, how do you choose the board? How do you, because there, you know, it's not that there's hundreds to choose from necessarily, but different types of boards can lead to different types of experiences. So if you're a woman looking to get into the corporate and the board sector, how should you find the, the boards that might be a good fit for you? I, I think it's really, a, again, my, my, my head immediately goes to the network, right? Um, it is is about knowing knowing what being being open to your different your career path and to thinking about what kind of experience you need and thinking outside of your direct line. Uh, just as Kirsten was saying, um, I, I agree with your your comment, Kirsten. I didn't think I was always looking for mentors inside of my career path uh, when I was in pharma. How how what what do I need to understand about my direct career path? But if I think back, some of the most influential um, mentors that I've had have been outside of that uh, of that space. And I think also those are the ones that have opened up diverse opportunities for me outside of my direct career line and have ultimately changed my career, my, my career path uh, on a couple of occasions. So I, I think when you're thinking about mentors and thinking about um, how do you choose a board, how do you try to position yourself um, for the best experience, you, you have to think outside of your own box, right outside of your own career path and think, what do I need peripherally um, that is going to be impactful? Okay, we've got literally two minutes left on this panel. I'm going to ask each of you very quickly to about the wor a word that uh, is sometimes considered for women to be um, inappropriate, which is ambition. What does ambition mean to you in your career? What would you say to a young woman coming up in 30 seconds, if you're in the elevator with her about the importance of ambition? And Anyi, um, one of my favorite ambitious women, I will start with you, <laughs> ambition. Um, I think I would say I'd come back to the words of, that I've used before, which is uh, risk-taking. That means accepting sometimes position you don't really feel totally comfortable with, but you're gonna get, you're gonna be able to do it. Do it. Do it young too. Don't start. I mean, there's there's not an age to start this. I'm not saying that, but um, I'm, I personally started very young, getting involved in all sorts of things. Uh, you and I we met in politics, Tasha, but that was a great way for me to meet a lot of people that were involved in all sorts of, of, of work, different, different work um, that I'm still in touch with, like 30, 40 years later. Uh, it's, it's, it, so it is important to get involved. Um, you, you're not necessarily going to have the board that you want right away, but if you get involved in another board, this might be the stepping stone to bring you to the board that you want to be on. So don't hesitate. Don't hesitate. Take some risk and, and do it. Um, Wendy, ambition in 30 seconds or less, what does it mean to you? What does it mean to a woman starting her career in the life sciences? Um, I'm going to say two words because I have 30 seconds. Um, passion and belief. Believe okay. in yourself and always do something that you're passionate with. Don't join a board if you're not interested in what they do. Very it's, good advice. It's not about just being on a board. It's about being passionate and believing in yourself. Amy, ambition. So first of all, Wendy, passion is absolutely something that you, you need. You have to believe in what you're doing. Um, yes, the other thing that comes to mind is risk and risk of failure. And I think women in general, we don't, we're not comfortable with the idea of risk of failure. 
But if you're ambitious, you have to get comfortable with the fact that everything that you, not everything that you're going to do, not everything that you're going to embark on is going to be a success. And it does not mean that you are a failure. That is going to be a lesson learned and something that you can use to, to continue to drive your ambition. So be comfortable with risk. Risk of failure does not mean you are a failure. That's excellent advice. And Kirsten, you get the last word on what ambition is meant to you and what it should mean to a woman in the life sciences charting her career. I, I think I would say be unapologetic in, in what you want to accomplish and go have the conversation. That's, that's the advice I give the most. Like if you want it, go at least have the conversation and see where it goes and be unapologetic about what your ambition is, what goals you want to achieve and go get them because that's what your male counterparts are doing also. Great advice too. Thank you so much, everyone. I want to thank Kirsten Coombs, Annie Perrault, Amy Finney, and Wendy Hurlburt. And I'm going to turn this over now to Deborah. Thanks all. Thank you, Tasha. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, all the speakers and, and to you as well, Tasha. This has been a fantastic discussion. I think our audience would agree with me that the issues related to diversity and inclusion for women in senior leadership roles has never more been in the forefront of our thoughts and our discussions as it is right now. And uh, I really appreciate that you've shared your personal experience and also shown an your vision for the kinds of changes that need to happen to get more women on corporate boards. Women in Bio Greater Montreal likes to imagine that we're part of that solution. And that's why this year we've started a pan-Canadian initiative called Excellence in Canadian Board Governance. As we've just heard, organizations are no longer focused on why they need women on boards, but rather how to accelerate this process. Women in Bio Greater Montreal in collaboration with the McGill Executive Institute has created a professional development program as part of the solution of how to accelerate this process for life science boards across Canada. And this involves a board governance program that will be delivered as 10 half day virtual classes from September to December 2022. This program is designed to tackle many of the barriers that exist for women wanting to take their seat on a board. And that includes broadening their network and making sure that their CVs and profiles are available to the companies that are actively searching for qualified candidates. The peer-to-peer -peer mentorship, which is crucial, that will develop amongst the diverse cohort of women leaders from across Canada. The skills-based curriculum, that will reduce the onboarding process, making both the candidate and the corporate board more confident in their choice. And finally, we believe the biggest impact our program will have will be the lasting change to company culture and discrimination when we see more diverse corporate boards. Now, if you're someone or you know someone who's interested in this program, we're looking for ambitious, senior executives, C-suites, founders, who seek to accelerate their careers and organizations by obtaining a holistic understanding of corporate boards, as well as newly appointed directors wanting to accelerate the onboarding process, or even current directors wanting to review or update their skills. That's why, Next slide, please. That's why as of today, International Women's Day, we're accepting applications. So please go to the Montreal website at womeninbio.org. Applications are open until the 3rd of June and all applications will be reviewed. And our selection committee will choose a maximum of 25 candidates from across Canada with the announcement of our first class on the 8th of July. If you have any questions, who would like to become a supporter of the program, please reach out to Montreal Board Program at womeninbio.org. As I've mentioned, we're running the program in partnership with McGill University. And so it's my pleasure to now introduce you to Marie-Hélène Laplante, Director of HR Services, Leadership and Governance Programs at McGill. After managing the Director's Education Program for many years, she is in the process of taking a more senior role in directing the program in the future. 
And at McGill Executive Institute, she is in charge of HR services and leadership programs dealing with both internal people and external organizations, training programs that reflect their needs. Join me in welcoming Marie-Hélène Lepin. Thank you, Deborah, and it's a pleasure to, uh, to meet with all of you and really inspiring women. So I feel lucky to be part of this uh, event today. So as uh, um, I'm Marie-Hélène Laplan, Program Manager at the McGill Executive Institute. So we are part of, of course, McGill University, part of the Dizotel Faculty of Management. So we are uh, delivering executive education throughout the world and um, de dealing with public custom mini MBA programs. One of our uh, public programs is actually called Women Entrepreneurs and Leadership Program. So I'm, I'm glad we are also uh, part of this uh, mandate with you. So today uh, I'll be talking more about the Director's Education Program. So the uh, ICD and Rotman Director's Education Program, jointly developed by the Institute of Corporate Directors and the University of Toronto's Rotman School of Management, is the leading national education program for experienced board directors in Canada. It is offered at Canada's uh, top business schools uh, and in Quebec, it's McGill University and was designed to build the competencies deemed necessary to be an effective director. Since the launch of the DEP, 6,200 directors have completed the program, taking the first step towards acquiring the ICD.D designation. So inspiring with, uh, inspired by this program, uh, Deborah and I uh, have been working on a custom version of this program that will be introduced to uh, the WIB Montreal Chapters Chair. So this will uh, be uh, five different modules. The first one being on strategy with two half days, the focus uh, on the important role that the board of directors and the administrators can play in an organization. Module two with two half days as well will be on human resources. So really with a focus on the board's role in human performance. Then module three would be two half days on duty of care. So everything related to the legal framework. Module four on board effectiveness. So uh, the uh, board composition, board information, board dynamics, the role of the chairman versus uh, the CEO, et cetera. And then the final module being on risk, again, with two half days. Uh, and this final module will uh, be um, assessing the work of the management team relating to the integrated risk management, as well as basic notions related to the management of enterprise risk and the role and responsibility of the board. So um, thank you everyone. And thank you, Debbie, for uh, this introduction. Thank you so much, Marilyn. So women in bio, excuse me, sorry. Uh, women in Bio Greater Montreal is a nonprofit organization, as I mentioned, and we recognize this, our strength is not just our members, but also the incredible community of support that we've received. And it's therefore important for us to thank all our sponsors who believe in us, believe in our members, and also this very important initiative. So, Thank you to all our speakers, to our moderator, and especially to Annie Pro and Bio-Quebec for working with us, for putting together this, uh, this event. It's been absolutely fantastic, and we're very proud to be working with you. So with that, I'd like to pass it back to Annie. Thank you so much, Deborah. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you to Wendy from BC, directly from Vancouver, and Amy, directly from Vancouver as well. Thank you to Kirsten in Toronto. Thank you to Tasha in Toronto. Thank you so much for doing this. And uh, thank you, Deborah, and all the people at uh, Women in Bio that uh, uh, put this extremely important program for women. And I hope it's going to be a success. I'm sure it's going to be a success. There'll be a lot of women interested now we need to promote it as much as possible. This, this web actually webinar has been recorded, so it will be available for those who haven't seen it. So pass it along, send it to everybody, put it on your website and on your social networks that this uh, program is available. I'm sure you'll get a lot of people registering to it. So thank you, uh, everybody. I wish you uh, a great end of the day. And I, uh, I, um, 
invite you to attend our next event at Bio-Quebec on March 24th. For those who uh, are in the life sciences sector, and most of you are, you know that the Court of Appeal Quebec just uh, made an incredible decision, very important decision on the PMPRB issue. We're gonna have a chance to discuss this with three lawyers that actually pleaded the case. And uh, from Faskin on March 24th, it will explain the decision and its consequences and then its impact for our industry. And um, so I ask you to take a look at the, uh, um, the event that will take place on March 24th. Everybody is uh, invited, obviously. So uh, thank you so much for all being uh, present today. I, I, I think it was a great discussion. I've learned a lot myself from all my colleagues on the panel. And um, I wish you a great day. And thank you. Thank you. Merci. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.